Thanks very much, Tommy. Um, and thanks, Sam, as well, for some really great advice there, uh, none of which that I've followed in these slides, so it's a shame that I didn't hear that previously. Uh, I'm Richard Towers. Uh, I'm a software developer at the Government Digital Service, part of the Cabinet Office. Uh, I work on a product called gov.uk. Um, you can find me on Mastodon here. Uh, other social media companies are available, but they are mostly run by bad people. Um, today, we're going to talk about a brief history of gov.uk's infrastructure. Um, and our long voyage to Kubernetes. So I'm going to have to talk about a few things for context that aren't super relevant to this con conference, but I can't really talk about the infrastructure without first talking about the product and the code. I'll try and rifle through these reasonably quickly. Um, first, a quick disclaimer. Um, we're here as historians. So this is a sort of history of about 10 years. We're not here to judge decisions that were made in the past. Uh, we have the benefit of 10 years of hindsight. The people making these decisions did not have the benefit of 10 years of foresight. Um, so I may occasionally criticize some things because I think it makes the talk a bit more interesting, but I'm picking at the bones of giants. These people did an incredible job, um, and the story is a story of success, and it's going to be upbeat, and it's going to be great. But a small content warning, there is one poem about death. So if poetry or death bothers you, uh, prepare yourself. Um, so with that said, let's talk about an early history of the GovUK product. Um, so I said sort of GovUK is about 10, 11 years old. I'm kind of interested of the people in the audience. How old are the services we support? So I guess most people here probably support live services. Um, if you could put your hands up if you support a service that's currently live, and then I'm going to say some years, and if people could put their hands down. So hands up, hands down if your service has only been live for less than a year, less than two years, less than five years, Less than 10 years, less than 20 years, 2003. We've still got anyone? One guy, two guys, three guys. All right, anyone more than 30 years? Anyone running services from the 90s? A couple of people at the back. Let's go earlier. How about the 80s? Before the internet? <laughs> One guy. <laughs> Round of applause for people running services that are going that long. That's really impressive. So for us, 10 years seems like a long time. In the grand scheme of things, um, we are one of the sort of older products of this, this audience. So that's kind of interesting. So I'm going to talk about what for us is prehistory. Um, this is about 2009. Uh, in those days, uh, this was the government's website. This is called DirectGov. Uh, I like to call it the original orange website. Uh, and it is better than the current orange website, but it was um, not perfect. Uh, in 2010, um, Martha Lane Fox, who is an internet entrepreneur, co-founder of lastminute.com, uh, was commissioned by a character called Francis Maud to do a review into DirectGov. Uh, and she produced this report, uh, which overstepped her brief a little bit. And rather than doing a, just a review into DirectGov, this one website, uh, she took the opportunity to do a review into generally how the government communicates with members of the public and how members of the public interact with government online. And the result of this was that a project called AlphaGov was kicked off. And this was a, an early stage alpha experiment into could we build a better government website. This was one of the early prototypes. Um, it was around the time of the Olympics, so there was a lot of sport. Uh, that was successful. And in 2012, we launched GovUK for the first time. Uh, and this is what GovUK looked like originally. Um, it replaced DirectGov, it replaced Business Link. This actually still looks pretty familiar to me, and the homepage has not changed that much over the years, which I think is testament to what a good job people did in the early days. Once it had launched, uh, there was still a large process of consolidation of other government websites. So there were previously hundreds and hundreds of indiv individual departments ran their own websites, and gradually all of those moved on to GovUK. The idea being that members of the public should not have to understand the structure of government to interact with it. But one thing that I would say is that what we often think of as GovUK now, and what I mean by GovUK in this talk are not quite the same things. So there are lots of government services that you probably all interact with regularly, applying for passports, renewing your driving license, filling in your self-assessment tax returns. Those are branded as GovUK, but they are run by other government departments. So when I'm talking about GovUK's infrastructure, I don't mean the infrastructure that literally everything in government runs on. I'm talking about the infrastructure that GovUK, the website, and the content management system that sits behind it run on. So that's about as much time as I've got for the product. Let's talk a little bit about code. So first of all, I've sort of explained it's a website. There's a content management system. Uh, I'm interested in the sort of biases of people in the audience. 
given this problem set, if you were to go back to 2011, uh, hands up in the audience who would build this using code you know, from scratch. And in a minute, I'll ask for the hands for buying it. OK, so a few people, yeah, decent chunk of people. Let's build it from scratch. And hands up if you would just try and buy it, you know, WordPress or some other thing. OK, I think this is probably about 50-50. So good. It's controversial at the time, I think. It's controversial now. The decision was made to build most of GovUK from scratch. Um, so we used Ruby on Rails, and we didn't use any previously open source content management systems or anything. Like We built more or less everything from scratch. And I think even with hindsight, it's hard to say that this was the wrong decision. Like We don't know what would have happened if we'd gone the other way, um, but the history of GovUK is mostly successful. And by starting with you know, a clean slate, empty code base, it meant we were able to meet basically any edge case that government threw at us. And if we hadn't been able to meet those edge cases, would we have succeeded? It's very hard to say. So it was built from scratch. As I've said, it's mostly a content management system on a website. How hard can it be, right? There's basically two ways of doing this. You can do a monolithic content management system where the members of the public that are looking at the website are actually interacting with you know, the server, WordPress, or whatever, and that also serves the interface for changing the content behind the scenes. Uh, or you can do what's called a headless CMS, where the publishing application is kind of separate from the front end that serves the website. Um, so I'm also interested in people's views on these. All I know that this is a DevOps conference, not a CMS developer conference. But of the audience, who would have built a monolithic CMS? Oh, not many. And who would have built a headless CMS? And who would have hedged and built one of each, just to check? <laughs> couple, couple. All right, so what we did was hedge one of each. Um, so this is a picture of GovUK's architecture diagram one year after launch. And this is way, way too small for anyone to read. But it's here to illustrate just how real things got, how quickly. So I'm not going to go into like how all of this stuff works. Um, but within here, there is at least one monolithic CMS. And there is at least one headless CMS. And there are lots and lots of microservices, some of which are well justified, and some of which are less well justified. Um, but suffice to say, we ended up with a very complicated code base very shortly after it went live. And so the infrastructure challenges, I think, were significant. Uh, so a few notable complexities that we had. First is caching. GovUK is mostly static content. What one person sees is mostly the same as what another person sees. And that means it can benefit enormously from um, us serving responses to people that always previously served to other people, which is caching. Um, and this goes back to... Um, Sandro's talk yesterday of trying to run efficient green software. You want to make use of CDNs. You want to do as much caching as possible if you can. Uh, and we did that even in the early days. So we had a content delivery network, and then we had layers and layers of caching within the infrastructure. A little bit of complexity, but definitely worth it for the scale. Databases. Um, even in that 2013 diagram, we already had MongoDB, Postgres, MySQL, and Elasticsearch. Uh, these are all individually very good databases. At least they are in 2023. Uh, I'm not sure I could speak for 2011. Um, but having all of them really feels like not the best decision. Um, <laughs> but they're all still with us for the most part. Um, and you know, it adds, obviously, complexity to the infrastructure. The other thing, you know, that very, very complicated diagram, I said a lot of it was justified. It's not just the CMS. It's not you know, how hard can it be. Um, GovUK also does various other things. It allows users to apply for various kinds of licenses and pay for them. And there are various question and answer formats that we call smart answers, which are difficult to cache and slightly interactive. Um, it allows members of the public to give government feedback. Either this website is wrong or this policy is wrong. Um, so there's bits of sort of form submissions. It does a lot of postcode-based stuff when someone wants to find out a service that's only available in a local area or the closest service to them. Um, and we had other things, performance platform, that allowed people to see how services were performing, trade tariff. You know, there's a lot of, lot of stuff. So it was complicated. So that's the product. That's the code. Let's talk about an early history of GovUK's infrastructure. So again, I'm going to do a show of hands. Um, basically, two ways to do this. Put it in your own data center, you know, rack it and stack it, uh, or do it from the cloud. So again, we're talking about 2011. Who in the audience would have done this on-prem? Decent number, decent number, surprising. And who would have gone for public cloud? OK, actually, I think a little more than half on-prem. That's really not what I expected. Um, we went for cloud, um, as possibly most people know. And the team had a number of, I think, really good DevOps principles even in the early days. So I think probably everyone would have heard of this one, um, the idea of livestock, not pets. 
So the way that I see this idea is uh, if you're buying a pet cockapoo or something like that, uh, you probably don't have to run a huge amount of infrastructure, at least not compared to someone who's maybe managing like a thousand head of cattle where you're going to need, you know, dips and big machines and things that they rub themselves against. Um, I gave this talk previously, and cockapoo owners have told me that this is actually not quite accurate, and the amount of infrastructure you need is quite a lot. Uh, but I think generally um, the, the point is there. So we're going to be running a lot of servers. We're going to need a lot of tooling to manage those servers. And even in the early days, the team were like, like quite clearly knew that we we're going to have to do a lot of this automation. So some examples of that. Um, in the early public cloud era of GovUK, it ran on a thing called the VMware vCloud Director. There are a number of like, cloud providers that, that ran this open source virtual machine management thing. Um, and with that, you could log into VMware vCloud Director um, user interface, and you could click around and you create virtual machines um, without having to like, phone up an engineer and get them to plug network cables in, which was like, super cool. Um, and they also had an API, but it was a bit shonky, um, and there weren't a lot of client libraries for it. And we were mostly Ruby shop, and there was no decent Ruby client. So we built this thing called vCloud Tools, which I think demonstrates the team's early, like, if there is a problem and there isn't code there that solves it, we'll write the code. You know, that everything has to be automated. We have to have the tooling, or this project isn't going to work. Oh. Uh, I didn't know who was sponsoring this conference when I wrote the slides, so thanks very much to Puppet for sponsoring DevOps days, but that's not why you're on the slide. Um, so we use Puppet. Like once we've got these, these virtual machines from vCloud Director, um, we then need to sort of pave them. We need to put files on them. We need to put services on them. We need to make sure the right cron jobs are running and all that kind of stuff. And so Puppet allowed us to do this. It allowed us to declaratively manage the configuration of those servers. Uh, GovUK Puppet is the open source Puppet configuration of GovUK. Uh, this image shows a graph on GitHub of the contributions over the years. So it's been running. Um, since 2012, but probably a bit earlier than that. Um, and there have been you know, tens of thousands of commits to this. And Puppet has been absolutely foundational to GovUK being able to run so much infrastructure for so long, so reliably. Another principle that the team had in the early days was this idea that regular releases reduce risk. Um, so rather than you know, bundling up a bunch of changes and having a big release every six months, um, the team knew that if we could deploy on like a daily basis, that would mean that we would, we would be able to have the agility to meet you know, the changing requirements and the requirements that we're discovering from government. Um, so to do this, we used Jenkins. We used a, a Ruby code base called Capistrano to deploy our Ruby apps. Um, and this little character here is the GovUK Badger of Deploy, who was a, an early team member. Uh, and they were basically a mutex. Um, so we wanted to make it so that only one person in the office could deploy it at a time because we were a bit worried about having multiple deployments. So you'd have to go and grab the physical badger, bring him over to your desk, um, and that would mean that you were the person who was allowed to do a release. <laughs> um, we have outgrown the badger over the years, even before some of this infrastructure work that I'm going to talk about. So he's now roaming free in the countryside of Whitechapel, I believe, uh, or someone's taken him home, I'm not sure. Um, so, you know, like everyone, we had to do monitoring, and we used a bunch of tools, uh, Isinga for alerting, Graphite for metrics, Grafana for visualization, and Elasticsearch, coincidentally another sponsor, but not why they're on the slide, um, to do sort of uh, queried log, uh, uh, structured logging and uh, log querying. One other thing that I'm going to call out about the, com sort of the complexity of the early infrastructure is that we had multiple environments. Everyone has multiple environments. It's probably not that, uh, not that edgy. We had three, integration, staging, and production. Uh, two things that were kind of interesting about this. One is that the data was automatically synced each night, so the production database would get restored into staging, the staging database would get restored into integration. And the other thing was that we had this idea of traffic replay. So all of the HTTP GET requests hitting the production website would be sort of stored up and then replayed against staging. And what that meant is, as we're doing a deployment of something in the website, uh, if there was some kind of edge case that wasn't caught by any of our tests, we might see it in the monitoring of staging. We'd see the error rate tick up, and we go, whoa, maybe we don't want to deploy this to production. So that was really cool. Obviously, it all adds complexity. Uh, I can't talk about the history of GovUK, sadly, without talking about migrations. Um, so the first infrastructure migration we did was in 2012, which was as GovUK was going live. We moved out of beta, and we did an infrastructure migration. Um, Two years later, we already had to do our second cloud migration. Um, same provider, but a different uh, data center. One year after that, we did another cloud migration. 
And then two years after that, we did a fourth cloud migration, this time from the VMware vCloud director things into a hyperscale cloud provider, which I'm not going to be able to keep anonymous, so I'll just say it was Amazon Web Services. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the platform. Um, I've sort of talked about how great it was, how we're doing regular releases, how we're doing all this DevOps stuff, livestock, not pets. Um, and it was great, but what was wrong with it? What motivated us to start thinking about differences? So the first thing is that upgrades were very, very hard. So we had virtual machines um, where we had maybe lots of applications, lots of front ends all running on the same virtual machine. Also a lot of tools on those machines. They'd have Puppet, they'd have you know, various monitoring tools, you, you know, all of the stuff, OpenSSL, all the stuff that you get on a Linux machine. And upgrading any bit of it was often difficult. And as we got further and further behind, as government priorities meant that we weren't able to do upgrade work, it got harder and harder to upgrade. Um, to the point that we were using an operating system, um, which you might be able to guess if you know what this animal is. Um, it's a tar, it represents Ubuntu 14.04. Um, and we, we got stuck on that version, basically. It was really hard to upgrade the operating system without upgrading other things. It was hard to upgrade other things without upgrading the operating system. And so we were finding this very, very difficult. The other thing was that scaling was difficult and slow. So in the top right of this, there is a screenshot of BBC News. Um, from that moment in 2020 where the UK decided that we were going to end the national lockdown and move to a set of local tiered lockdowns. Um, and everybody in the country wanted to know which tier they were going to be in. Now, usually information on GovUK is available on GovUK and we're the authoritative source, but we're not the only source. On this occasion, we were the only place that you could find out which tier you were going to be in when the restrictions changed. And that meant that we got a huge amount of traffic. And we had expected to get a huge amount of traffic, um, orders of magnitude more than we usually get. Uh, but the traffic we actually got was orders of magnitude more than the orders of magnitude than we usually get. It was orders of magnitude more than we expected. And every single one of these people was entering their postcode into a form and submitting it, making a post request, which we didn't cache at the time, which resulted in a huge spike of HTTP 500s. Um, and this was bad for users because they couldn't find out what their lockdown tier was going to be. And it was bad for the on-call team because the first thing that you do in this incident is think, I'm going to scale things up. I'm going to give things more CPU or I'm going to scale out horizontally. But scaling out horizontally for us meant creating a bunch of new VMs, waiting for Puppet to make them look like the VMs we wanted to, and then, crucially, waiting for Jenkins to deploy all of the code onto them, which end-to-end -end took probably about half an hour, which is half an hour that people can't use the website. And this could have been solved without a huge overhaul, uh, but it would have been a significant overhaul just fixing this one problem, and upgrades would, sort of would have been different. So around this time, we started revisiting GovUK's platform choices. So there's a note here that I have to say. We've talked a little bit yesterday about platforms as a service, um, and I can't really do this talk without mentioning GovUK platform as a service. So if you've worked in the public sector, you might have heard of this. If you have worked not in the public sector, it might be alien to you. Um, GovUK Pass was GDS's attempt to write a platform as a service that could be used by service teams across government. So not just within our organization, but also you know, in the Department for International Trade and every other department in government. Um, and this was solving a real use case. Um, there are a lot of people building services. Um, they all have to do basically the same thing, run web apps. Um, and the idea was that by building this, we'd be able to enable those teams to do that more more quickly um, and more cheaply. Um, and by most measures, it was really, really successful. So the team built just an, inc an incredible service. Uh, developer experience was amazing. Um, it was really, really successful. But going back to the complexity of GovUK's architecture, it never quite made it to the point where it could easily have run the whole of GovUK. Uh, originally, it didn't deal with microservices particularly well, which we obviously had a lot of. Uh, in its latter days, it didn't deal with secrets management very well. It didn't deal with infrastructure as code very well. So although it was an incredible service, it never quite made the right fit for, for GovUK itself, which made its name a bit strange. It was called GovUK PaaS, but it was always the PaaS that GovUK never ran on. Um, <laughs> More recently, the decision's been made to, to decommission the service. I don't have time really to go into that, but I think suffice to say it's the right decision. It's very sad. I think some of the best engineering work I've ever seen happened on this team, uh, but ultimately uh, the, the platform has been decommissioned. So if not PaaS, what else? Um, we've been talking about containers, I think, since basically even before GovUK launched. Um, they've been around for a long time, obviously. 
Uh, containers, probably everyone knows, but the idea of taking your application, bundling it with all of the dependencies that it requires to run, you know, OpenSSL, everything up from the operating system kernel, um, and deploying all of those as a single package onto some compute somewhere. So we'd been thinking about containers a lot. Um, and we'd also been thinking about Kubernetes. You know, you can run containers, that's easy, but how do you like, make sure that all of your microservices are working? How do you scale them and all of that, all of that kind of stuff? Uh, these three little cartoon characters here are from the Children's Illustrated Guide to Kubernetes, which I imagine most people have seen, but if you haven't, it's a wonderful resource. Um, a guy called Matt Butcher put it together, you know, ostensibly for his kids to explain how Kubernetes worked. Um, this giraffe is called Fippy. Uh, she goes on an adventure on Captain Cube, who is the owl on his giant boat, which is made up of rafts. Uh, and Z is Fippy's friend, uh, with whom she goes to the zoo later. So this gives a kind of view of Kubernetes that, you know, it's all fun and games, and, you know, it's a really accessible platform. And I think that's really valuable to the community. But we didn't really believe it. <laughs> so here's my poem about death. Um, I think... To summarize how we felt about Kubernetes, um, I'm going to this, this poem by T.S. Eliot. Uh, part four of The Wasteland is a, is a passage called Death by Water, and it goes slightly adapted, something like this. Fippy the giraffe, a fortnight dead, forgot the cry of gulls and a deep sea swell. A current under sea picked her bones in whispers. As she scaled up and down, she passed the ages of her age and youth entering the whirlpool. Developer or ops, O oh, you who turned the wheel and looked to windward, consider Fippy, who was once handsome and tall as you. So Eliot's poem is about sailors and how before you set to sea, you should think very carefully about the sailors who went before you. And I think this is how we felt when we looked at Kubernetes. This is, you know, like a complex, terrifying platform, like the ocean is a, a terrifying thing. Um, and sailing on this ocean felt like a last resort. You know, any platform that is simpler than this will be better. So initially, we sort of dismissed it kind of out of hand because of this feeling. So here's the other elephant in the room. We're going to play a game of who's that Pokemon. Uh, AWS logos, who's up on them? Which one is this? Anyone call it out? ECS, ECS. well done. Uh, this is the inscrutable logo of Amazon's Elastic Container Service. So if you want to run containers, this is the other option. So when we first started working on this, like we're going to run GovUK in containers, we had this choice, GovUK, PaaS, Kubernetes, ECS. ECS felt the right, like the right thing to do. What we discovered, though, as we embarked on this project is that the map is not the territory. So we had planned out how we were going to migrate this thing to ECS. We'd looked at our architecture diagram. It's got boxes on it. It's got lines on it. The boxes are Rails apps. You can run those in ECS. The lines are HTTP requests. You can make those in ECS. This is going to be easy. Um, in practice, <laughs> we found that it was not quite so. So some things are just not on our architecture diagram at all, like a whole monitoring stack. Just, we just don't draw it, right, because it's just too complicated. Um, there are HTTP requests that go directly to a service that's behind a load balancer. You can't really draw that because you don't draw the load balancer. So, as we embarked on this, we found all of these little edge cases. And we found is that although we could make this all work, we were having to build a lot of complexity outside of the platform. And so around 2021, we started thinking, like, is this really worth it? You know, we've, we've avoided this terrifyingly complex platform that someone else has built. And what we are building is a terrifyingly complicated solution on top of a simple platform. So are we really getting any benefit from this? And so the team decided that they were going to pivot to Kubernetes. So here we are. What does GovUK look like on Kubernetes? Uh, so we've tried to be as basically as vanilla as, as we could be. Uh, we're using Helm as the sort of configuration management, I guess you'd call it, um, in Kubernetes. We use it to install Helm charts and packages. So our, like Prometheus stack is coming from, is coming from a, an open source Helm repo. Um, and this little tiny character in a rocket ship is, is the squid of Argo CD. And we're using Argo to do like GitOps and deployments. Uh, we've switched out some of our monitoring. Uh, Graphite's been replaced by Prometheus. Um, same, same, but different. Um, scaling is something that we can do now, um, happily. So we can do both vertical scaling, which is to say this application needs more CPU, it needs more memory. Please, could I have some more CPU or memory Kubernetes? And we can do horizontal scaling easily as well. Uh, so an application's running three instances. It should be running 10 instances. Uh, that's one commit to a repo. Argo will apply that 
change to Git um, to the cluster and we'll immediately get more instances. Um, we are doing auto scaling for the cluster, um, but we're not doing it for the apps themselves. We can scale up you know, within minutes, and, well, within seconds instead of tens of minutes, and that's made a huge difference. Upgrades, which was the other big problem we had, are now much, much easier. Um, each individual app is bundled with its dependencies because it's in a container. Uh, and so when we need to upgrade something, we can do it in a, in a like, more gradual, risk-free way. We do have some new things to upgrade, Kubernetes itself. Uh, we've done a couple of Kubernetes upgrades now. They are a bit scary. We have had to mess around with pod security policies a lot. Um, but ultimately, uh, we feel like we're in generally in a better position and that we will be able to keep stuff up to date more easily. So when does this new platform that I've been talking about go live? Well, I'm not some comic book villain who explains their evil plan while it can still be stopped. Uh, all of this stuff has been live for several months already. It went live in March. Um, and it has but gone incredibly smoothly. I, I think probably nobody noticed outside of GDS when the platform went live, which is what we aim for in all of these migrations. Um, and since then, it has been doing a brilliant job. Some rough edges, but uh, you expect that. Uh, it's been doing a great job. So a few lessons learned. Um, I'm not sure what lessons you will have learned. I'm not sure what lessons I've learned, but here is an attempt at calling some of them out. Uh, so one that I learned really while I was doing this talk is that migrations are a fact of life. Uh, for us, I'm not sure if it's true everywhere. Um, this actually came to me as a bit of a shock because I am hoping that we will not have to do many more migrations, right? Like you always hope that this one's the last one. But then you look at the, the wheel of time that grinds through 2012, 2014, 2015, 2017, 2021, and you think, are we not going to do another migration? And I think part of the fact of working in government is that we do fair and open procurements. Potentially, any cloud provider could win our next procurement, and we could have to migrate. So I think this is something that we just have to bear in mind. And this is another strength that Kubernetes has, because everyone and their mum's cloud provider runs Kubernetes now. Um, I've already used this slide, but I'm just going to say it again. Um, the map is not the territory. I think this is true in every organization, right? You have your architecture diagram. It's a map of how things work. How things actually work is not going to be exactly the same as your architecture diagram, in the same way that a map of a country is not the same as the territory in the country. And if you're going on a walk across an area and you find that it's unpassable, um, it is best to go back and think about whether you're still taking the right route. Um, you know, you don't plan your route and then just go for it, even though you discover that the territory is hard to pass. Um, if you want good outcomes, you need to give teams autonomy, and you need to make them feel safe. So I think one of the things I'm most proud about in this project is that the team felt like they could say, this thing that we plan to do isn't the right thing to do. Um, the fact that they were brave enough to say that, I think, says a lot about the team. Um, and if I could also credit management the fact that they were listened to, um, and what seemed like a pretty scary business decision, you know, like we've been working on this thing for months, it's supposed to be going live in a few months, you know, this pivot was a, was a big decision. Um, and I think, yeah, giving the team autonomy and making them feel safe was instrumental to them being able to make this decision. So don't forget to do that. And that's all I've got. With a minute to spare, um, I just want to quickly say thank you, first of all, to the audience for all of my straw polls. That was really interesting for me. Uh, secondly, to the organizers of this conference, you've been really, really amazing. And thirdly, to everyone who's worked on GovUK's infrastructure over the last decade or so, that some of them in the audience today, um, I can take really no personal credit for this. Uh, there's almost none of my code in any of these repositories. Um, but people have worked you know, over a very long time, and it's all contributed to what we have now, which I think is a really solid piece of infrastructure. So thank you, everyone.